and start recording this presentation. Um, so again, welcome to Zoom into Archaeology. Um, our presentation today is Luna by Land and Sea, the Archaeology and History of a 1559 Spanish Settlement Attempt here in Pensacola, Florida. And before I moved to the Florida Panhandle, this is not something I learned a lot about in school, um, but it really is a really very important part of, of Florida history and really the history of the United States and North America as we know it today. So um, hopefully we'll learn a little bit something today about this history and the amazing archeology span that the University of West Florida has been doing over the years. So let me go ahead and share my screen. I've got a presentation with some great uh, photos. Let me go ahead and put my presentation up. Oops, give me one second here while I manage three screens. It's hard to wrangle all of these screens at once. Okay, and sharing my screen. Let's see, can everybody see the PowerPoint that I'm sharing? It should be a big image. Um, just give me, let's see, let me open my chat function here. Everyone can see it. Okay, great. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate that. Um, and I'll be letting in folks to the presentation as we go. So if I get distracted, it's just because I'm letting um, latecomers into our meeting. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about uh, the Luna expedition to Pensacola, Florida. So if you've done any presentations with the Florida Public Archaeology Network before, you know that one of my favorite first things to do is to talk about what archaeology is. And that's because there are a lot of misconceptions about what archaeology actually is. Um, so I'm just going to run through this real quickly. I know some of you are very familiar with this, and some of you are new to the presentation. Um, so this is a good, good place to start. What is archaeology? And the best place, I think, to, to really consider what archaeology is, is to talk about what archaeology is not. Archaeology is not the study of rocks and the earth. That is its own science, uh, geology. Um, archaeology is also not the study of dinosaurs. That, too, is its own science. That's paleontology. And some people think that archaeologists are only looking for uh, valuable things, right? Gold, silver, and jewels. And that too is not archaeology. These people are specifically looking for things like treasure, right? So we call that treasure hunting. Uh, archaeology instead is way cooler. It is the study of past people and cultures based on the materials that they left behind. So archaeologists deal in the tangible to learn more about the past. And of course, we just have some examples of what archaeologists might study on this slide. Whether they're very large things like those three cannon in the center image that were actually uncovered here in Pensacola over by Naval Air Station Pensacola, um, or very small artifacts like that tiny pot shirt on the left hand side of the screen. Um, and then of course, we have artifacts that are right in the middle in size. And on the right-hand side of the screen is a barrel well that was actually dated to the British period here in Pensacola. So artifacts range in size. And archeologists, no matter how big or how small it is, it reveals some information about the past. So archeologists are interested. Here in the United States, archeology span is actually a sub-discipline of anthropology. So most archeologists you meet here in the United States don't actually have a degree in archeology. span uh, their college degree is probably in anthropology. And anthropology meaning just the study of human beings and their immediate ancestors. Almost everything about humans is covered under the field of anthropology. And the four subdisciplines of which archaeology is one includes cultural anthropology, the study of human cultures, past and present, uh, biological anthropology, which is the study of human biology and human ancestors, and linguistic anthropology, which is study of human language. And then, of course, my favorite, uh, the, the field that I decided to focus on is archaeology, um, the study of past people and cultures based on what they've left behind. So what is an artifact? What do archaeologists study to learn about people? Um, we don't want to write that archaeologists study stuff when we write our technical reports and publish papers. So instead, we've coined the term artifact to describe anything made or used by humans, and generally, um, those artifacts date to 50 years old or older. That's just kind of a loose definition that archaeologists use. Um, and so artifacts, again, range from very large to very small. 
They can include things like these glass wine bottles. Um, hint, if you're following us on our Facebook page, uh, these onion bottle wine bottles are the answer to our what is it Wednesday quiz for this week. Um, so it can be our glass bottles. It could be something like a dugout canoe. This is a pre-contact canoe found in Florida um, that was made um, as long ago as 2000 years ago. Um, and then on the far right, we just have an image of several um, tiny pieces of pot sherds broken. So this is probably one plate or one vessel that had been broken at once. People in the past are just as clumsy as we are today. Although they don't have trash pickup, um, they did bury things in their backyard, which for archeologists is very convenient. So you'll pardon my cruise through um, archeology span and contextualizing the talk a little bit, but it's important for us to get that message out there. Now let's focus specifically on the Luna expedition. This is what we're here to talk about. And what I'm first gonna do is I'm gonna go over some of the history and background to the Luna expedition so that you can better understand the archeology span that has been done on land and underwater. Right, so our story really begins in the opening of the New World. After Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, um, all of a sudden European powers became very interested in the New World and all of the resources that were here in the New World, and Spain in particular during this early period. And so we have several expeditions from Spain, these expeditions um, mostly of discovery, right? We're not trying to settle this very early on, but to discover what's out there. And so some of our earliest expeditions include Juan Ponce de Leon's expedition in Florida in 1513, Hernan Cortez's expedition into interior Mexico where he met the Aztec um, from 1518 to 1520, um, more expeditions along the Gulf Coast and the, and the Gulf of Mexico um, by Narvaez in the 1520s. Um, we have Pizarro entering Peru and his famous, um, I guess you could call them misadventures, uh, with the uh, Aztec in Peru in the 1530s. Um, Hernando de Soto famously returned to Florida and really almost the entirety of Southeast, what is now the United States in 1539. Um, and then, oh, sorry, we arrive. Um, finally, Spain kind of makes its way all the way to the west coast of what is now the US. Um, sorry, letting folks into our room here. Um, with Coronado's expeditions, right, in the 1540s. So Spain was really all over the New World during this period, trying to find any kinds of resources that could be exploited for their benefit. And this is kind of setting the stage for uh, this, the creation of new settlements. Um, once you know what's there, then you can decide strategic places to establish your settlements. Um, so and that's when we have in 1559, Spain finally decided to establish it's a first settlement in what is now known as the United States. And this settlement was chosen to be in what is now Pensacola. Um, and there were several reasons why uh, Spain decided to choose the Pensacola area as the, the location for their first settlement. Um, but the individual chosen to lead the settlement, as many of you probably know, uh, was a gentleman named Don Tristan de Luna y Ariano. And so one of the reasons that Florida, and in particular this part of Florida, the Pensacola area in Florida, was chosen as the location for this Luna settlement uh, was because it was, uh, thank you for correcting me on the, I said the Aztec in Peru, I think you're correct, it is the Inca. Um, the, the reason that they decided on Pensacola in the Florida area was strategic, right? Florida is kind of right smack in the middle of North America. And as the 1500s kind of wound on, um, you start to see interest in the New World from England and from France. And in particular, um, the shipping routes to and from the New World to Europe. And so Spain kind of figured if they were able to establish a settlement in Florida, they could protect their shipping, right? And what was going back and forth from Central and South America to Spain uh, were essentially what we would call riches. Um, there were, of course, were gold and silver and some of those uh, valuable metals, but also uh, spices and dyes and wood. All of these things were, were worth quite a bit of money in Spain and in Europe. And so Spain needed to protect its fleet and its shipping uh, from attack. And so Florida was kind of right smack in the middle. Almost all ships traveling to and from the new and the old world had to go through the Strait of Florida to get back to Europe. Um, and so the idea was that if they could colonize Florida 
and establish this buffer zone against the English who were starting to settle in the northern part of what is now the United States and the French who were starting to come down the Mississippi River and establishing in Canada and elsewhere, um, that perhaps they could create a buffer zone of protection. And so, Kind of this plan to settle Florida was hatched in 1557 by Spain and Don Tristan de Luna was chosen to lead the expedition and then eventually become the governor of Florida. Um, in June 1559, all the pieces came together and Luna and his fleet of ships departed from Veracruz, Mexico to find this ideal location that had been identified in earlier expeditions. And Spain referred to this area as Ochus, we know it now as Pensacola. Um, and so Luna's fleet included 11 ships, right, of 450 soldiers, including 240 horses. Um, but most importantly, this fleet and the settlement included colonists, 1,000 colonists, including women and children. The idea was to create a settlement, not to create a fort, um, to something that could be self-sustaining in the long run, right? Um, and so in August of 1559, um, after this kind of roundabout route, you can see that Luna took. Um, they left Veracruz, Mexico, you can see there in June, sailed north kind of along the coast of Mexico, kind of passing by Texas along the continental shelf. They were actually blown significantly off course um, right till they got to about where Louisiana is today, almost all the way back down to the Yucatan Peninsula. And then they sailed all the way back north, kind of bebopping around the coast of Florida, going over to Mobile Bay, realizing Mobile Bay, Mobile Bay was not the place they wanted to be because you can't get a Spanish galleon into Mobile Bay. Um, if you aren't familiar with Mobile, it's very shallow, very muddy. There's no big ships getting into Mobile. So once they made it to Alabama, they decided to turn back around and eventually found where they had wanted to be originally, and that was, of course, what we call Pensacola Bay today. Um, so once they made it there, um, they began the, um, the task of starting this new settlement. And I would be remiss if I didn't add that among those 450 soldiers and 1,000 colonists, um, we say that there were African, Aztec, and um, indigenous Mexican colonists. Um, the word colonist kind of glosses over the fact that many of these people were forcefully brought to Pensacola by the Spanish. Uh, they did not often go of their own doing. Um, they, were, they were enslaved, essentially. Um, but in most cases, these people were brought as labor or as bodyguards for the colonists. Um, and among the supplies that Luna brought with him, um, it was everything you needed to establish a settlement, right? They brought food, corn, hardtack, bacon, uh, beef, cheese, oil, vinegar, wine, um, live animals like cattle and pigs, chickens. Um, they also brought arms, armor, and tools. Um, when DeSoto came through the Southeast earlier in the century, he didn't make a lot of friends during his expedition. He was not particularly kind to the indigenous people living in the area. And so there was, uh, I imagine, still a lot of resentment going around those people. And so the Luna expedition was likely aware of this and decided to bring what they could to protect themselves. And of course, we don't want to forget possible incursion from the English and the French if they had learned what uh, the Spanish were up to in Florida. And so there was a lot of correspondence between the Luna expedition once they arrived in Pensacola and uh, the Viceroy, Don Luis de Velasco of New Spain in Veracruz, Mexico. And so Luna, um, in this correspondence, Luna described the location that they chose and why they chose it. And then the Viceroy um, actually communicated this information then to the Spanish crown in Spain um, to kind of justify their expense uh, for the settlement attempt. And in one of his letters, Don Luis de Velasco's letters to the Spanish crown, he mentioned that uh, Pensacola, right, is what he's talking about, is one of the best ports that there is among what has been discovered in the Indies. The port is so secure that no wind can do Luna ships any damage. Um, famous last words, right? So as many of you know how the story goes, um, the Luna expedition, after about one month of arriving, was hit hard by a hurricane. And this is not a satellite image of that hurricane, of course. This is a satellite image of Hurricane Katrina, um, which had a similar path um, 
although it, it kind of veered uh, further to the west. Um, but the Luna expedition was hit hard. And based on the loss of life and the damage to property, uh, modern researchers estimate that the, the hurricane that hit the Luna expedition was probably a category three or a category four. So we're not talking about a small storm. And so during that storm, uh, there was a significant loss of life and supplies. And we know this because of the continued correspondence between Luna and the Viceroy. Um, the decision was not made to immediately abandon the settlement attempt, so um, conversation was ongoing. Um, the reason why the Spanish and Tristan de Luna decided to choose Pensacola Bay for their settlement uh, was like Don Luis de Velasco said before, they thought it was a relatively safe place. And if you're familiar with the um, geography of Pensacola Bay area, you know that there's only a very small way to get in and out of Pensacola Bay. Um, there's some high land in the area and there's lots of sources of food and water. And so the idea was that these Spanish ships would be fairly protected once they were further in Pensacola Bay. They would have access to plenty of uh, needed supplies, especially fresh water. Um, and also importantly, these very large ships carrying colonists and supplies could get into a deep water port like Pensacola, right? Mobile was shallow. Pensacola is actually quite deep in comparison. I mean, it was thought that this kind of combination of uh, characteristics would allow the Spanish um, to be relatively safe in the Pensacola Bay area. And of course, the hurricane proved that to be untrue. Um, in the storm, the Luna expedition um, lost seven of its ships. These ships sunk. Um, one, of it, one of the ships was driven up onto land. And we think this is one of the smaller vessels that was just kind of picked up and um, shattered on, on the sand on the beach. Um, three of the expedition ships did survive, but this is because they were out of the Pensacola Bay um, before the storm even struck. So it was kind of a, um, you know, it was a circumstantial for them, um, fortunately. Um, in February of 1560, so this is some time after the storm, um, Luna and the colonists that remained in the area decide to, or some of the colonists that remained in the area, decided to move north into Alabama to attempt to find support from some of the local indigenous people there. Um, and this was uh, not very successful. Some of the colonists remained behind in Pensacola and there were um, various uh, ships coming in and out from Mexico to resupply the settlement. Like I said, Spain was not ready to give up on Pensacola. Um, so they kept trying to resupply, but the settlement proved over time to be unsustainable, even after seeking help to the north. And so by March, 1561, Spain formally discharged Luna of his uh, position as new governor of Florida, and they officially abandoned the settlement attempt in Pensacola. Um, and they moved over to Florida's east coast. And so this is kind of when you get those uh, probably more famous and long lasting early Spanish settlements uh, that more of us are familiar with. And of course, St. Augustine usually gets the title here in Florida. There's a big rivalry between Pensacola and St. Augustine about which was actually first. Uh, Pensacola is indeed the first multi-year European settlement in what is now the United States, uh, but it has not been continuously lived in by people. And St. Augustine has, so that's why we call St. Augustine the first city in Florida. Um, but the Spanish did move over to the east coast to St. Augustine by 1565 and settled there. Um, St. Augustine, the location chosen for that settlement was also strategic. Um, again, it's in an area that would be great for launching attacks on other ships or other countries attacking Spanish shipping along the Straits of Florida, but also it kind of prevented further southern incursion um, from the French in particular, who were starting to settle in South Carolina and Northeast Florida. So let's jump into the archaeology. In particular, or first, we're going to talk about the underwater archaeology. Sorry, letting some more folks in the room here. So the underwater archaeology of the Luna expedition. And I will preface this archaeology section by saying that Pensacola and the University of West Florida have been honored with a very unique archaeological uh, site or sites. There are very few places in the world where we have 
underwater archaeological sites that correspond directly to a colonial settlement attempt. This is relatively unusual. And so UWF um, has been very lucky and the state of Florida have been very lucky to, to have uncovered what they've uncovered so far. So as far as underwater archaeology goes, shipwrecks are entirely different animals than terrestrial or on-land archaeological sites. And shipwrecks are important and I think very interesting because of um, both their closed context, so meaning uh, everything that went down with a shipwreck is usually still there when an archaeologist comes by however many years to study it. Um, and there's excellent preservation on these shipwreck sites as well. Um, so you can see these are just some photos of artifact collections from some of the Luna ships, um, particularly Emmanuel Point One. We call them Emmanuel Point because of where they are located on the landform. Um, so Luna ship number one and Luna ship number two, also called Emmanuel Point One and Emmanuel Point Two. Um, and the image to the left showcases um, a partial olive jar, some of the stone cannon shot. Um, a reconstruction of a breastplate that was found on the Emmanuel Point One shipwreck, as well as some other assorted artifacts. Um, but really remarkable, and especially in regard to preservation, is the discovery of very small animal bones and animal remains. Um, one of the most unique, is, you'll see on the top right, is this black rat skeleton. Um, and a rat you know, rats are large, but they're not very large, and their bones can be quite small. And the fact that the remains of this black rat have survived on the Luna ships, uh, Manual Point One, since 1559 is incredible. And why did that happen? Um, Florida waters are noto notoriously warm and filled with animals that want to eat whatever ends up in the water. Uh, well, where the Luna ships wrecked during the hurricane was actually outside of the confluence of several, several major rivers. And over time, the sediment outflow from those rivers covered up the shipwreck. And so that's why we see this amazing preservation, particularly on these shipwrecks. And so these black rat bones indeed have been preserved amazingly well. And uh, what's interesting about them too is that they're actually some of the very first remains of the black rat in what is now the United States. So making Pensacola uh, the home of the black rat. So a, another first for Pensacola's history. So below that black rat are just a, a few more artifact examples um, and just kind of showcasing some of the very excellent preservation on sites like the Emanuel Point Rex. So again, just to recap, the Tristan de Luna expedition was really the first attempt at a permanent European settlement in Florida and in what is now the United States. There were 11 ships. Uh, we know that three made it out. One was kind of smashed on land and seven were sunk by the hurricane. Um, and of course the settlement again co was comprised roughly of 1500 people, a thousand of them being colonists uh, with women and children. Um, when that hurricane struck in 1559, there was a major loss of life, but the settlement went on. Um, of course, over time, um, the settlement was abandoned and, um, you know, archaeologists looking back years later um, wanted to, we've had these historical records about the Luna expedition, um, and there was always a big interest in finding the remains of this settlement attempt, but it eluded archaeologists for some time. And it wasn't until 1992 um, that the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research, uh, led by the late Dr. Roger Smith, um, decided to do a survey of Florida waters to take stock of all of the archaeological resources in Florida waters. And the plan with this uh, survey of Florida was to start in Pensacola area and to travel around the state through the Keys and make its way up the peninsula to uh, the Jacksonville or Fernandina Beach area, right? The northernmost eastern part of Florida. So covering the entirety of the state. Um, and as they started to do this survey, uh, they found something fairly significant early on. And of course that ended up now, as we know, being the very first ship that we've attributed to the Luna expedition. So this survey didn't make it very far in Florida before finding something significant. So that should just show you how amazing Florida's underwater archeological resources are. So the first Luna shipwreck was then discovered in 1992 by Dr. Roger Smith's team. Um, and the University of West Florida was brought in. Um, Dr. Judy Bentz was part of the archaeology program um, then and was interested in working with the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research um, to do conservation of artifacts and to assist with the project. 
Um, the University of West Florida continued to do survey in the area, knowing full well that there were more Luna ships still to be um, rediscovered. And in 2006, during a survey, they actually did identify a second vessel, what we call the Emanuel Point Two wreck, um, during their survey. And then in 2016, of course, um, survey continued because we know that there are more wrecks out there. Um, surveys continued and a third wreck was discovered in a little bit shallower water in 2016 by the University of West Florida. And so if you're familiar with Pensacola, right, um, we've got Pensacola area, we're far west in Florida. You can see Pensacola Bay leads into Escambia and Blackwater Bay and East Bay. Um, there's only one way in and out of Pensacola Bay area, which is right through Pensacola Pass right here. And so again, you can kind of see why the Luna expedition and the Spanish um, officials thought that this would be a really uh, well-protected area from a hurricane. Not only do you have the barrier island of Santa Rosa Island, you've also got the Gulf Breeze Peninsula, right? Potentially to break wind from any storms. Um, so anyway, so the Luna ships, um, obviously we don't point out the exact location of the ships, but the relative area where they've been discovered is right here where there's this red mark. And this is off of a landform called Emanuel Point, hence why we refer to them as the Emanuel Point 1, 2, and 3 shipwrecks. Um, and that area, let's see, we can got a photo here. Um, so again, if you're familiar with Pensacola, um, you know that this long bridge kind of extending out in this photo, in the photo we're kind of looking northwest, that long bridge is three mile bridge that leads out to the Gulf Breeze Peninsula and eventually out to Pensacola Beach. And then off to the east of that bridge, you can see this little white speck in the water. That's actually the University of West Florida's research platform. Um, and this is a relatively old photograph. We do have a new research platform, but it is not currently out um, because we have not been doing field operations this year. Um, but you can see that white research platform there. And in that relative area is where our Luna ships have been located. And you can see that there's a, a good sandbar there right underneath the, the research platform. And so it's easy to see how a relatively large ship could be kind of dashed against the sandbar by a hurricane. And that's indeed what we think happened with these Luna sh ships during the hurricane. Um, so how was how were these ships discovered? Um, and this is kind of just a general map. Obviously, the University of West Florida doesn't use boats quite as large as this research vessel here. But the ships were discovered using a technology called magnetometer. And a magnetometer is essentially like a glorified metal detector. Um, and that magnetometer is towed behind a boat, so dragged through the water. And what it's doing is it's detecting disruptions in Earth's magnetic field. And the idea being that if something interrupts that, um, that reading of Earth's, Earth's magnetic field, then it's potentially something large enough that would be worth um, considering as an archaeologist. Sometimes as archaeologists, when we go back and we dive on these various targets that we've identified, it's nothing more than a washing machine or a bicycle, or sometimes it's somebody's car that's in the middle of Pensacola Bay. Um, but sometimes they are indeed archaeological sites. And in this particular case, during that 1992 survey, it was an archaeological site. Now today when we use magnetometer and other survey equipment, um, the readouts that we get are all digital, they're on a computer. Um, during the time of this initial survey in 1992, there were actually um, kind of tangible physical printouts. And so what we see on the left here is that printout, um, one of the original um, notifications that there was a, a major magnetic anomaly that would be worth investigating. And of course that ended up being the Emanuel Point One shipwreck. And so the photos on the right are um, some of our faculty and former students doing survey in Pensacola Bay, not necessarily as a part of that 1992 survey. Um, but the Emanuel Point One shipwreck discovered in 1992 has been a, a source of amazing information about this settlement attempt. And it was really the first archeological site identified um, with the settlement attempt from 1559. And if, if I don't know how many of you are avid scuba divers, um, the diving on the Emanuel Point shipwrecks in Pensacola Bay is not the greatest, 
right? Most students at the University of West Florida, if they're doing maritime archaeology, cut their teeth on these shipwrecks um, as archaeologists. And so we all have a lot of experience diving in almost zero visibility water. And so the photo you see here is actually the Emanuel Point One shipwreck on a relatively good day. You can see some of the fish swimming in the background, and you can see some remains of the ship's ballast pile there sticking out of the water or out of the, the surface of the bay. And so some of the artifacts that were recovered include um, things like olive pits, which again, incredible preservation for being as old as 1559. Um, one of the more interesting artifacts and one that we don't quite know the story about is this little ship uh, carving made out of wood. And so we don't know if this particular artifact was um, something that a sailor or someone on the ship whittled to kill time. Maybe it was a children's toy. Uh, maybe it was used as a plan for building or constructing the ship. We don't quite know what the story is behind that artifact, but whatever it is, it's probably an incredible story. On the shipwreck, uh, there was also uh, the remains of some Aztec ceramics or Aztec pottery. And of course, this is kind of one of what we would call a smoking gun artifact because we know from historical records that there were indeed Aztec people who were brought along on the Luna expedition um, forcibly, but they were there. And of course, they would have material culture or items that they brought with them on this expedition as well. And so this pottery is really some excellent proof of that. And then of course, here are our rat bones again. Amazing preservation. One of the interesting things about the rat bones is that they actually showed signs of rickets, which is actually a lack of vitamin D from sunlight. And of course, that jives well with a rat who's been living in the bottom of a ship for a very long time. So again, a really fascinating find. And then these, the ceramics you're seeing here are some additional um, ceramics found. And these are Spanish ceramics, so not Aztec, but we find remains of storage vessels like olive jar, um, but also nicer kind of glazed food serving uh, ware as well. I mean, here's just a, a, a rendering, a drawing rendering of the Emanuel Point One ship. You can kind of see it kind of in ghostly outlines there um, with what the shipwreck site actually looked like as archaeologists were excavating. So it's just kind of to give you an idea of um, the big difference between what we think about as a shipwreck um, and what archaeologists are actually seeing. And in this case, what usually all we're seeing sticking out from the water is this um, that stone ballast pile from the ship. Um, although I will say that during the magnetometer survey that identified the shipwreck, the magnetic anomaly that kind of lighted up the survey software was actually uh, the fluke of an anchor from this shipwreck, which is now on display at the T.T. Wentworth Museum here in downtown Pensacola. So you can visit it there. And so kind of moving on, um, we've got the Emanuel Point One site was identified in this area where that red circle is. Um, the Emanuel Point Two site identified in 2006 is actually not very far from that original Emanuel Point One site. It's about 200 yards, I believe. Um, so very close by. And of course, again, when we're talking about jiving with historical documents, this would make sense, right? These ships were anchored in Pensacola Bay, um, probably right next to each other as people were settling and establishing themselves on land. And so the University of West Florida and the research platform, and this is actually the older research platform that we have here uh, featured in this photo. We have a, a new platform that was courtesy of um, the Patty Shipbuilding, which, which is currently, of course, in dry dock during the time when we're not working. Um, but on this old research platform, um, you know, hundreds, I would say, possibly hundreds of students um, in maritime archaeology at the University of West Florida came through to learn the process of underwater archaeology and to do some amazing work in researching this site. And so Emanuel Point Two had, again, some incredible artifact remains that helped us learn a great deal about the Luna expedition and the settlement attempt, um, including some, um, this is a leather shoe sole that's kind of broken there. Um, Again, a leather shoe sole surviving from 1559 in relatively good condition is pretty incredible. Um, 
one of our, one of the um, kind of notable artifacts too from Emmanuel Point Two was the discovery of this spoon. This is a wooden spoon, and probably would have been an everyday spoon for someone on board the ship. Um, usually, a person would carry around their utensil with them, so this would have belonged probably to a single person. Um, so, pretty fascinating artifact there. Here is another really quite amazing artifact from a manual point to shipwreck. And we believe that this is a um, hygiene device. Um, so it kind of looks like a Swiss army knife. You see that there are, there's a little handle with multiple tools. And we believe that this was probably used um, as a um, set of tweezers kind of, or like an ear pick um, or a lice pick or a tick pick. Um, a personal hygiene tool basically is what we think this was, toothpick even. And this, of course, is um, a stopper for a barrel. Um, and this, of course, is further evidence of some of the, the large amounts of supplies that the Spanish brought with them to attempt to settle uh, Pensacola, which is amazing. So we have a manual point one. We have a manual point two, um, one and a manual point two, kind of along this kind of sandbar in Pensacola Bay. And then in 2016, an additional survey revealed the remains of another shipwreck. And after um, looking at the ship's remains and some of the artifact assemblage on that shipwreck, it was determined that this new shipwreck was indeed part of the Luna expedition. But as you can see, this new shipwreck, Emanuel Point 3, is a little bit further inland toward the Emanuel Point area. And that's because uh, archaeologists believe that this was a much smaller ship than the other two ships. The other two ships were tentatively identified as galleon type ships. Um, and this smaller one um, was probably a ship that would have traveled in between the larger ships carrying supplies or people or messages. Um, and that's probably why it's ended up so much further onto the shore. And so Emmanuel Point 3 obviously has been, uh, is, is a lot newer than the other two shipwrecks. It's not been worked on quite as much as Emmanuel Point 1 and Emmanuel Point 2, but there has been work conducted on it. Here's one of my favorite photos of Emmanuel, uh, UWF students working on the Emmanuel Point 3 shipwreck site. And you can see them um, kind of meticulously taking notes and recording measurements as they excavate in the sand. Um, and you can see underneath the clipboard here, you can see some of the large timbers um, from that third shipwreck. So it's quite astounding. And the nice thing about Emmanuel Point 3 as well is that it's a little bit more in the sand and less sediment than the other two shipwrecks. So visibility on this side does tend to be a little bit better than the other two sites. All right, so let's talk about the terrestrial archaeology or the archaeology that's been done on land. Now the archaeology that's been done on land again is relatively recent. Um, Judy Benz and the UWF Archaeology Institute have been looking for the Luna land settlement site for many many years but it has evaded them for the most part and that's because Pensacola of course since 1559 has really grown up. Um, especially the downtown area. There are lots of homes and development um, over many hundreds of years at this point. So it can be really difficult to identify a very old archaeological site like this in a relatively urban area. Um, but it was in 2015 um, that a former graduate of the UWF archaeology program potentially identified some artifacts in a Pensacola neighborhood that looked suspicious to him, suspiciously like 16th century Spanish colonial artifacts. And so he came to the University of West Florida Archaeology Institute and sought help in maybe learning a little bit more about this site. And so as the UWF Archaeology Institute kind of investigated this discovery, um, they were finally able to make the determination that this was indeed the remains of the Luna settlement. And so here is a, an image from the 2016, early 2016, I believe, uh, press release about the discovery of the site, the official announcement. And you can see um, a lot of the UWF archaeology staff standing there with Dr. Benchley, um, the head of the UWF Archaeology Institute, um, kind of at the podium there, and Dr. Judy Benz, former UWF president, uh, standing right behind her. 
Um, and the quote here is from Dr. John Worth, who is one of the now principal investigators of the Luna settlement site on land. And I love his quote because he, he gets so excited about archaeology, in particular archaeology from this time period. And what he said was, what we saw in front of us in the lab that day was an amazing assemblage of mid 16th century Spanish colonial period artifacts. Right. And again, when we talk about kind of smoking gun artifacts, here it was again, something that had not been found elsewhere in Pensacola and was a good indicator that this was the Luna site. So again, this discovery was kind of first reported to UWF in October of 2015. Over the next couple of months, the UWF did some shovel tests in the area to determine whether or not they could substantiate um, the reports of these artifacts. Um, interestingly, the Luna Settlement site is under a, a neighborhood in the Pensacola um, Heights area, East Pensacola Heights. And so a lot of the work that UWF has done has been in partnership with local landowners. UWF has needed permission to go onto their land, onto their property, to do these tests. And what I find really inspiring about this project is that a lot of these landowners have cared a lot about this history and archaeology, probably because it means that their neighborhood is now one of the oldest neighborhoods in the United States. And uh, so with, with the good graces of these landowners, UWF has continued their work out there, and they still do, um, apart from this year, of course, when we're not doing our field schools. Um, so you can see some images here of UWF staff doing these shovel tests. Um, importantly, I mean, again, this is an area that's been lived in for many hundreds of years at this point, and the remains of a 1559 settlement are going to be very small. Also, Florida has very acidic soil that tends to eat away at things. Um, but, of course, if you're familiar with archaeology, you know that even subtle things like the changes of the color in soil can provide archaeologists with information about these sites and about the people living at these sites. And so through careful excavation, um, we have UW, UWF has indeed been able to substantiate that this land settlement site is indeed under East Pensacola Heights in Pensacola area. And so again, the remains from this land site are relatively small, right? They're not as well preserved as those underwater sites because they haven't been hidden away from site for the last 450 or so years. Um, but for archeologists, even the smallest artifact can tell us a big story. And so among some of the artifact types that the terrestrial archaeologists have uncovered at the Luna Settlement site include uh, ceramics. And I took some information from Dr. John Worth's um, very excellent blog on the Luna Settlement site. And according to his blog, the University of West Florida has uncovered 15 kilograms of ceramic sherds since they initially started investigating the site, um, amounting to about 2,800 sherds. Being, having been excavated, um, which is fairly incredible. And these ceramics are similar to what we found on the shipwreck sites, right? Because they belong to the same group of people in the same time. Um, so we find things like olive jar, but also some more glazed uh, ceramics um, indicating food service or food eating. Um, there have also been some ceramics, uh, Aztec ceramic as well, which I think I have a photo of that next. Um, so you can see in this image, the Aztec ceramic you'll recognize on the top from the Emanuel Point One shipwreck, and then some less well-preserved but equally identifiable Aztec ceramics from the land settlement site. And so I've said this before, again, smoking gun, right? These things correlate with one another. And we really have no other record of Aztec people being in the Pensacola area apart from this Luna expedition. So those correlations are very strong. Um, the Aztec ceramics that have been found amount to about 4% by count and 2% by weight of the total ceramics discovered, um, but this is fairly significant, and it does mean that these people were there, which is an amazing discovery. So other types of artifacts that have been covered from the terrestrial site include a variety of metal artifacts, including uh, lead line weights um, that were salvaged from the shipwrecks, um, from the sheathing along the underside of the wooden hulls of the shipwrecks. These may have been used to um, do some fishing after the hurricane. Um, copper bells, 
copper rosettes, uh, which you can see in the top part of this image on the right. These would have been decorative pieces on um, probably on Spanish armor, right, or on their helmets. Um, we can see a copper aglet here. And for those of you who aren't familiar with aglets, we actually do still use them today. Um, if you think about your sneakers at home, there's a little plastic piece on the end of your shoelace that helps you lace them through um, your shoe. Um, and that's exactly what this is. It's just copper. Um, possibly used for shoes, but more likely used for, for lacing clothing items. Um, other metal artifacts include things like fasteners, um, of course, for building um, and constructing, the Luna Expedition brought practical things with them, uh, like utilities needed to build their homes. And so there are a lot of fasteners in these assemblies. And then carrot-headed nails, which are kind of a, a unique find for the Luna Expedition site. They don't sound very exciting. These are actually um, used to um, attach horseshoes or to, uh, yeah, attach a horse uh, to its horseshoe or horseshoe to its horse. Um, but these are really interesting artifacts because they have not been found at any other Spanish colonial site in the United States except for um, the Coronado sites out in Southwest and the Southwest of the United States. And so these are an artifact that date to a very specific time period and that would correlate very well with the time that Coronado was out um, in the Southwest. So kind of a very interesting find there. Other interesting finds include glass beads. Um, these are particularly beautiful and kind of become the icons um, for the Luna expedition. Um, these glass beads would have been brought potentially as trade items uh, with locals to kind of curry favor with them if they ever needed anything um, or just to get in their good graces again after the Soto expedition. Um, but really kind of beautiful, um, very datable artifacts um, that point to that period of the Luna expedition, which is very, very interesting. Um, in recent years, um, Dr. John Wirth and the UWF archaeology students at UWF have been focused on identifying potential structures out at the Luna settlement site. So trying to lay out the plan of the settlement over the modern landscape. And one of the really interesting things that they've been able to discover are um, burned remains and the remains of post holes. And so a post hole essentially is the hole in the ground that was dug to um, situate a wooden post. Uh, that wood obviously has not lasted in the ground since 1559, um, but the decay of that wood over time has stained the soil. And that's essentially what you're seeing in this image here. What's interesting about this particular image and the inset image on the right is that what you're seeing are some olive jar sherds, broken olive jar sherds, in the area of this post hole. And what's really interesting is that some of these broken sherds kind of in the depth of this post hole, mended or fit together with olive jar sherds that were closer to the surface. And so what Dr. John Worth believes is that based on this, um, the post holes were probably dug after their destruction, the destruction of the ceramic sherds, um, meaning that the broken sherds um, were probably used to line these post hole pits and may relate to the period of major hurricane damage meaning that they were probably damaged or broken during the, the storm. Um, and that what we're seeing is a building that was constructed after that storm as a way to start rebuilding um, in, at, in early 1560. So potentially really interesting remains of hurricane damage there. Um, and then in some of these post holes, this is a, this is a burned feature with the, the remains of some wooden burned posts. Um, charcoal remains, um, allow us or allow archaeologists to actually potentially get a radiocarbon date for when that wood that's found in this area was burned, right? And so uh, there's an undergraduate student working with Dr. John Worth who got a grant through the University of West Florida to do some carbon dating. And what she found is that the charcoal remains in the bottom of this postal actually came back with a radiocarbon date of the 16th century or the 1500s, right? And we know that other than the Luna expedition and some really quick passing through of other expeditions, um, that there, were, there was no one here in the Pensacola area building these kinds of structures with these kinds of artifacts um, during this time period. So again, another kind of smoking gun pointing to the Luna expedition. And of course, the Luna period falls right in the middle of that 16th century date range because they were here in 1559. 
And so if you visit Dr. John Wirth's um, blog on the Luna Settlement site, there's a, a ton of amazing information. And it's easy to just Google Luna Settlement site John Wirth um, blog online. And all of this information is on there, too. He's really very prolific in posting when he's in the field. And this is an interesting diagram that he came up with. Um, so what you're seeing here is the Luna Settlement area in East Pensacola Heights. And if you kind of remember, oops. If you remember from our map of the shipwreck sites, you'll know that the shipwrecks are just south of here in the water. Um, and this kind of schematic of the Luna Settlement site shows where boats, smaller boats would have landed coming to and from those larger vessels. It shows an area where there's a freshwater spring that would have been a source of fresh water for the settlement. And then it shows a, a relatively large 27 acre area under East Pensacola Heights where the Luna settlement is likely to have been located. Um, and when the Spanish laid out this area, they laid out uh, the settlement to be about 140 lots. Uh, and of course of various sizes, um, five by seven, I think is what Dr. John Worth has determined in roughly in our measurement terms today. And a hundred of those lots were intended to be for family or individual homes. Um, and the other 40 were for the construction of a plaza, a church and a warehouse. And so that's what would have been in this projected uh, Luna settlement area, which is really interesting. And this again is where archeologists are continuing to work today, although not actively right now due to COVID-19. And of course, like with everything in archeology, span this is only the beginning. Archeologists have been working on Luna related sites since the discovery of that Emanuel Point shipwreck in 1992. And with the amazing research uh, done by our students at UWF, uh, the amount of information that we can find out about early settlement life in the 16th um, century is, is really kind of limitless. And we have an amazing um, kind of unique settlement um, or a unique situation here in Pensacola with the underwater in the terrestrial sites. So there's, there's a lot yet to be discovered and there's a lot more archeology span that we could potentially do. And of course, I always like to emphasize when I talk about archaeology and artifacts is that the artifacts themselves and these material remains of the past are really very interesting and they make excellent museum exhibits and everyone's very interested in the artifacts. Um, but the artifacts are really only part of the story. As archaeologists, what we're really trying to get at is the humanity behind this history, right? Learning of what, what day to day life was like for these people, why they came to Pensacola, um, what caused them to drop everything in their lives in Mexico and come with Luna to establish a new settlement. These are the kinds of stories we want to get at as archaeologists. And if sites are protected and preserved and people appreciate the archaeology that is literally in their very own neighborhoods, um, then we can learn so much about the people that came before us. And I think in many ways identify uh, with their lives. And the, the painting that's in the background of this slide is kind of interesting. It's a Diego de Velasquez painting um, from about 1618, I think it's 1623, um, somewhere in there. But it shows a lot of the similar material culture artifacts that were found um, on Luna sites, including this kind of glazed, ceramic here. Um, we see some glass bottles. Out of the image you can see a mortar and pestle similar to one that was found on the shipwreck site. So kind of an interesting way to correlate what we found in archaeology um, with paintings and other forms of historical documentation. And I end every presentation with what you can do to protect our heritage. And I've kind of talked about this a little bit already, but the protection and preservation of archaeology really relies on the interest of local people. Um, archaeologists can talk all day about how fascinating and interesting and how much we learn about these sites, but if local people don't care for them, um, then, they, then they won't be preserved for posterity. And, and it's really up to locals to talk to their city council, the county commission, um, representatives, senators, about the importance of archaeology and history and why it matters to our communities. Um, so I always like to put that out there for everyone. We rely on you to help us do our job and to help you learn more about the past. And I'm gonna go ahead and do a shameless plug real quick before I get to questions. Um, we're gonna continue Zoom into archeology span into August. 
Um, and we have great archaeology that we're going to feature from around the state. Um, and I can show you those here in a second. We're also doing a new children's series um, based on a book that my colleague Mike Toman and I wrote called Luna the Cat. And this is a story about a cat that was on the Luna expedition when Luna came to Pensacola and his trials and tribulations as he joins the Luna expedition. Um, so we're going to read that live from August to September, a couple chapters a week. Um, and this is a great program for kids to learn a little bit more about history and archaeology by through a really interesting story. Um, so we're going to do that as well. Uh, follow us on Facebook to learn about all of the events we have coming up. And you can also explore our website, fpan.us. And of course, if you need to revisit any of the presentations or you want to share these presentations with anybody that you know who wasn't able to join us, you can find them all on our YouTube channel if you just search Florida Public Archaeology Network on YouTube. Um, so we have lots of ways to access information. And I'm going to go ahead and end my presentation. Let me go ahead and pull up my screen again. I'm happy to take questions. Um, maybe I'll go through the questions in the chat box. Um, I see someone asked how far apart are the lunar wrecks. I think probably my later slides gave a little bit more um, kind of context for that, but manual point one and a manual point two are only about 200 yards apart from one another. Um, and then the third shipwreck is a little bit closer towards shore, a little bit further away. Um, but again, they're all kind of clustered in that area. And we, you know, obviously there are additional shipwrecks yet to be um, discovered related to the Luna expedition. And based on what we found thus far, it's probably not too far-fetched to believe that the other shipwrecks are probably not far away. Um, so, so hopefully we'll be able to continue survey into the future and learn even more about um, the rest of this expedition um, or the fleet in the expedition. Um, and then I see another question about if UWF has determined the footprint of the buildings on the land settlement. And I guess probably my later slides um, probably answered that question a little bit as well. Uh, the answer is yes, to some degree. Um, the remains are kind of sparse and hard to tease out in some cases, um, but they are there. And, you know, the fact that we um, are able to take our time in excavating and do so very carefully and record everything that we find means that we're able to catch those real subtle changes in the soil and kind of detect where those potential structures used to be. Um, so great question. Um, and then another question here, um, how much of the settlement is built over? Um, Almost all of it, I would say, has been developed at one point in time or another. There are areas that are there may have empty lots over it, but that have been developed in the past. So there's a lot of disturbance um, going on in the area where the Luna settlement site is located. Fortunately, like I said, the local landowners um, in that neighborhood have been really amenable to UWF coming out and doing shovel tests and digging up their backyard. Um, in some cases, before they build a pool, so the archaeologists are actually doing the hard work for them, um, or before they put in new flower beds or whatever the case may be. So it's been really an amazing ongoing partnership, and it can just show how university and academic programs in archaeology can really work with local communities toward a common goal. And I really think it's um, it's really a notable thing about UWF archaeology is how how well it does public archaeology in general. And I'm glad to be a part of that, of course. Um, let's see, any more questions? Feel free to type them in or you can unmute and ask the question too. Um, let's see, question here. Do the horseshoe nails mean that they brought horses? Yes, yes, indeed they do. Um, I don't know, we saw early on in the slide kind of the list of things that Luna uh, had with him on his ships. And yes, along with the 450 soldiers uh, that came with the expedition, there were about 240 horses um, that came as well. So I don't know if you can imagine sailing 240 horses on 11 ships with 1,000 colonists and military men um, over the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it's pretty astounding when you think about it. And I think records indicate that not a lot of the horses or not all of the horses made it all the way across the Gulf of Mexico. And then some additional were lost during the storm as well, unfortunately. But yes, they did indeed have horses with them. The Spanish tended to bring everything they needed uh, to settle. They didn't like to use 
local resources very much. Even though they needed fresh water and they could go fishing in the bay if they needed uh, food, they liked their food. And I think that's the case with everybody. You want those comforts of home. So they didn't tend to rely on the landscape solely to support them. They would have brought everything that they needed. Um, a question about diving the shipwreck site. So this is a really interesting question. Um, there are actually no restrictions on diving these shipwreck sites um, for individuals who want to go and dive them. Um, you can do so. The numbers are not, the number of the GPS locations for the dive sites are not published, obviously, because of, because um, no, no real archeological site coordinates are published. Um, but um, I think they're in general, um, Shipwreck sites in particular are known by fishermen and, and they're all over the Gulf of Mexico archaeological shipwreck sites. People fish on them, people dive on them all the time. So no, there are no restrictions. The only restrictions when you dive archaeological sites is in the removal of artifacts or damage to the site. You cannot disturb the settlement or the sediment um, or remove any artifacts from the site. That is indeed against the law. Um, the, the, pen, the bottom of Pensacola Bay is um, state-owned bottomlands and state-owned bottomlands are defined as anything you could technically float a canoe on for at least part time of the year um, and that goes out to nine miles into the gulf of mexico as well um, so indeed it's state lands um, which means you would treat it like a state park and you don't want to disturb the sediment and you don't want to remove anything from the site so you can indeed dive on it um, i will say it's not the greatest dive in the world it's often very murky um, there's not a whole lot to see and as archeologists work on the site, um, we do tend to cover it back up so that anything we expose is again, preserved in the settlement. In the sediment, I keep switching those two words, preserved in the settlement, sediment um, for posterity, right? Just in case we come back with another research question in the future and we need to go re-excavate the site. Um, we don't just excavate to excavate, we do so guided by research. Um, so yes, can dive the sites, don't disturb, don't remove, um, but yes, possible to dive them. Um, let's see, got some good feedback. Well, thank you all for joining me for this presentation. I really um, enjoyed talking to you about it. I will kind of close by saying, you know, I'm giving this presentation, but, and although I have worked on the Luna archeological sites, I'm certainly not the one who is leading this project. And I'm not the person has been doing the most work on these projects over the years. Um, there are a lot of other faculty and staff at UWF um, who have put in this hard work. So I'm here to kind of share their work with you and give you a little bit more information about what has gone on and to kind of pique your interest in Pensacola and Florida history and archeology. span um, So thank you all for being here. I enjoyed talking with you this week. Join us in the coming weeks in August, Thursdays, always at 3.30 p.m. Um, to learn a little bit more about archaeology in our Zoom into Archaeology series. And throughout August, we're going to have topics from all over the state of Florida. Um, so I'm bringing in some FPAN staff from our other regions to talk about archaeological sites in their area, just to broaden our horizons a little bit uh, for August. So again, thank you all, and we'll see you again soon. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. My email address is in the chat box, um, or you can find my email address on the FPAN website. You can also contact me through our Facebook page as well. So thank you all. Have a great week.